Thank you all for coming uh, to the next of our presentations dealing with a variety of elder law issues. As, as you know, my name is Arthur Bergeron. I'm an attorney. I work at Myrick O'Connell. There are 63 of us at Myrick O'Connell. I'm the elder law guy. So there's somebody there that pretty much can deal with everything, and it allows me to pretty much only deal with these issues. So for the fall, uh, I thought that I would do two presentations specifically about living at home, because as you know, um, the goal of my friends Frank and Mary, um, whom we've talked about a lot in our presentations, is to never leave home. They want to stay at home until they die. They want to be buried in the backyard. So the goal is, what's the plan that allows them to do that? Um, and I wanted to be, so I wanted to be talking about that. But you know, they what they want, they love to stay at home. Um, but what they really don't want to go do is go to a nursing home. That's why I always tell them. I tell my Frank and Mary's because I got a lot of these people, right? If one of you is getting more disabled, right, for whatever reason, the last thing you want to do is have one of you kill yourself taking care of the other one that's disabled because then that person's really stuck, you know? And so that you, you, you always want to be kind of thinking about your ideal is to stay at home, to never have anybody come into your house, right? Because it's your house, right? And you're just going to take care of each other. But the question is, short of that, what are the other options that you have if what you want is to be as independent as you possibly can, right? And to be minimizing the chances that you're going to end up in a nursing home. So in this first presentation, we're talking specifically about assisted living uh, as an alternative to being at home because there are certain situations where you kind of can't make it. And with me to talk about that is Jerry LaRusso. Uh, Jerry is the, are you officially the executive director? Are you, yes. Yes. Of yes. Worcester. At, at Worcester. Christopher Heights of Worcester. Regarding Christopher Heights of Worcester, as you know, the Christopher Heights system, you have, I think, want to say four facilities? Or yeah, one five. in Web we Five. Webster. So Alabama. you're going to talk about those. So I invited Jerry to talk about assisted living and kind of how that works and at what point Frank and Mary want, may want to think about assisted living. Um, and then, um, for the second part of the program, I invited a woman named Patty Surveys. There is, the, the, uh, as many of you know, there is a substantial veterans benefit that is available to veterans and to their um, uh, widows after the death of the veteran uh, to assist them in staying independent. And that veterans benefit has a big, big application in these assisted living facilities. And I know that from my experience in dealing with other places, often as many as 25% of the people who are in assisted living are there with the veterans benefit. So I want to bring Patty in to specifically talk about the veterans benefit, to talk about it kind of in general, what, what it's available for, and to talk about how it would fit into assisted living. So once again, as brief background, Frank and Mary, you remember them. Uh, today, they have a house that is worth a lot. They have a house that's worth eight hundred thousand uh, dollars. They have an IRA that's in the bank. That's they've got some cash in the bank. They have an annuity that's worth about a hundred thousand dollars. They have joint bank accounts worth about seventy-five thousand dollars. So the bottom line is, they have a house that's paid for and that's fairly valuable, and they have some cash or cash equivalents, but not a lot. They have about two hundred twenty-five thousand dollars in other assets. So they're okay staying in their house. Uh, as long as they don't have serious medical problems. But, they, but Frank's income is limited to $2,500 a month. He's got a pension you know, or, of $500 a month, and he's got Social Security of about $2,000. Uh, and Mary has Social Security of $1,000 a month. So their total income per month is $3,500. And once they've run through that income, they need to be drawing on their savings, and their savings are not substantial. 
right? And certainly the house is available for some stuff, like reverse mortgages and stuff, but that's really kind of a last resort. So what we want to talk about is if you're Frank and Mary, and, one of, and, and if you're Mary, even if you're starting to not feel great, right? Even if you're having a little harder time get around, getting around, and maybe you've got a walker, right? And maybe, you know, you really don't want to be making beds in the morning, you know, but, you know, if you don't have to, or making all the meals, there may be a point at which these folks say to themselves, you know, we want to stay independent. God knows we don't want to go to a nursing home, right? Um, but we really can't stay independent in our homes, or we can't unless we spend a lot of money, unless we bring a lot of home care into our homes, right? Unless we adapt our homes substantially. Um, and even then, if there's just the two of us, if there's an emergency, you know, where's the, you know, our kids live all over, you know, we, we, how are we going to do this? And, and so it's in many of those situations that assisted living becomes an option that you want to be thinking about. So. Uh, once again, I'd like Jerry to just be talking to you about that and about the places where assisted living would be appropriate and then how it works. And then, as I, then we'll take questions from Jerry and then if Patty hasn't showed up, we'll stop and we'll wait for Patty, right? And then as soon as she shows up, then we'll, then we'll do the, uh, the veterans piece. Thank you very much. Jerry. Thank you. Please stand right here. Okay. And I'll listen in rapt attention to your <laughs> Good morning. Thank you for coming. Again, I'm from Christopher Heights of Worcester. Um, we also have the president of our company here, Walter Ohanian. Uh, Christopher Heights, we have five campuses. We have one in Marlboro, one in Webster, one in Attleboro, one in Worcester, and we manage what Haywood Wakefield Commons in Gardner. Our campus in Worcester also has a long-term care nursing and rehabilitation center located as well, which is very convenient for those people that do live with us and our other campuses if they need rehab, if they have a hospitalization. So what I'd like to talk about is, when is it time to go to assisted living? A lot of people, quite honestly, wait a little bit too long to go into assisted living. So there are a couple of questions you want to ask yourself as you're thinking about making the next step out of your home. And again, as Arthur pointed out, just because they don't want to go. They don't want to go. You they want never to be buried in the backyard. They That's right. To to right so ask yourself. And you're so expensive, but we're going to get. That. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> we are going to get. That. We're not as expensive as most, <laughs> which is a benefit. And a lot of people do shy away from assisted living because of the costs. And we will talk about some of the options that are offered to you, where assisted living actually is very affordable and a very good option to keep you as independent as possible in what we refer to in the industry as the least restrictive setting. The nice part about assisted living is you have your own apartment, you still have your own privacy, you have your own setup, you don't have to do any cooking, your meals are provided for you, you have nursing care available to you on a limited basis, and I'll get into that when I talk about the Executive Office of the Elder Affairs, but we do have nursing staff and what we call companions there to help you. But to step back a little bit and talk about when is it time to go to assisted living, and, and as Arthur said, a lot of you want to stay in your own homes, I'm going to ask you this. What's your quality of life in your own home? It oftentimes gets very lonely. You oftentimes may start to forget to take medications. There's not anybody there to remind you. You may forget to take them. You start to have more and more physical problems, and you start to slow down. 80% of elders are diagnosed with depression. And a lot of times it's a lack of socialization and companionship that you have. And although you want to stay in your own home, again, if your television is your best friend, then assisted living is probably a very good option for you. When you go to assisted living, you have the advantage of having your privacy, staying in your own apartment, but if you would like to go see somebody or have some companionship, there are other people that are in very similar situations to you that are there 24 hours a day. Again, your meals are all done for you. So now nutritionally, you're going to be getting balanced meals. Many of you or many of people that you know may be getting Meals on Wheels, which is a fabulous program. But wouldn't it be nice to have a meal with somebody, to be able to have some socialization and someone to talk to, people that have grown up in your generation, which is referred to as the greatest generation. You have so many fabulous, wonderful stories 
that are so appreciated by myself and so many other people. And wouldn't it be nice to share your life experiences that are so unique with other people that are in situations like yourself? So although your home sounds like the best place to be, and you may have lived there for 50 years, excuse me, 50 years, is it really the best place for you at this point? Are you feeling good? Are you healthy? Are you taking your medications? Are you able to get up that flight of stairs into your bedroom that you, that you slept in for 40 years? Or are you now sleeping on the couch in the living room and restricted to the bathroom downstairs because you can't get up those stairs? What if you don't feel good at 2 o'clock in the morning? Who's there to take care of you? You might have a lifeline, which is a fabulous program as well, and I'll get into how we use that in assisted living as well, but there's not somebody right there. Another factor of assisted living is the peace of mind of knowing that when you pull a call light or when you push that lifeline, you're going to have a caring human being that's going to be in your apartment within five to ten minutes. Versus By the way, I'm just going to mention... If, you, if this isn't applying to you directly, although, of course, it may. That's the thing about the thing I love about doing elder law is that I always used to think that disabilities apply to disabled people. You know who they were. They were kind of these funny people, you know. But it turns out that's me, right? It's always, it's like disabled people is me when I'm 80, you know, or 85, right? But if this doesn't apply to you, if it applies to a neighbor of yours, remember, we always do these broadcasts on cable so that they get rebroadcast and tell people that they can see this, right? Because I think it is important. As, she, as, as Jerry describes it, I mean, I deal with clients like this all the time. A lot of folks, they just get, I know it's great being in your house, but it gets dangerous there. And if you know somebody that would just, just to have them think about this, I think it's important. Sorry. And again, family, as much as we would all love our families to be around and take care of us, the world is different now. You now have children that are overseas in jobs or in other states. They're just not close by. So that if your family also doesn't have the peace of mind, if you're living at home alone, are you safe? They're worrying about you. You know, is mom okay? Is dad okay? I can't reach her on the phone. You may get up quick to go answer the phone and slip and fall. There's any number of things that can happen. But again, I think ultimately, when I see people come in and ask about admissions, one of the biggest things I hear is the loneliness. You know, being alone and not having the companionship. And it's wonderful for me where my office is in my building. If I look outside at any given time of day, I'll see anywhere from 5 to 15 residents just sitting out there together, just laughing, just enjoying each other. Or we have, we have pub time every day at 3.30. And everybody just comes down. And again, it's just the camaraderie. It's being able to share your history and share your stories and, and know that other people care and you are not alone and you're appreciated so your quality of life really does improve you get up and you get dressed every day because you're going down for dinner so you're feeling good about yourself and again you're meeting with those friends and it does keep people out of nursing homes longer because we're able to provide services to keep you at your highest functioning level what we do at Christopher Heights is we bring in an outside agency that does occupational therapy, physical therapy, and nursing. So when you come into Christopher Heights and we do an initial assessment and see how you're functioning, you may be very, very independent. We have people there that drive. They're still driving. They bring their cars. Six months, a year down the road, we may start to see something slip. It could be something as much as, boy, they're coughing a little bit at dinner. They're not doing as well at dinner. They may be having a swallowing issue, or they're slowing down, and they're, rather than walking straight down the hall, their gait's going a little to the left or to the right. The advantage that isn't of, because they went to pub time. No, that's not. <laughs> <laughs> we take that into consideration. But <laughs> we do the assessments in the morning. 